Hey everyone, what's up? Hey guys, so um, thank you for joining our Med Mentor Weekly Clinic live session. Um, just waiting for everyone to come on. We'll start in just a minute. Sweet. So how's everyone been? Um, hopefully we've got a few members with questions on. Hello, Body Band Studio. Thanks for joining us again. Liked your questions the last few weeks. They've been intriguing. Um, so guys, I'm here, um, I'm here to answer your questions about the medical school applications process. I'm here to talk about um, life as a medical student, life as a future doctor, um, the NHS system in general, interview tips, UCAT, BMAT, personal statement, you name it, wherever I can help with. Um, you, uh, we're here to kind of troubleshoot your problems and uh, provide that interactive um, kind of interface to get you guys through these, um, these few months to a year to when you have to apply. Um, so, yes, so drop your questions below, either in the comment section or on the question cards. Um, and do feel free to join in yourself if you have any suggestions, as we've had in the last few weeks. So a few things that we've spoken about in the last few weeks was, for example, what do you aim to do whilst you're in medical school? What books do you, um, do you, should you be reading or, um, or any recommendations that you have before applying to university to put in your personal statement, talk about an interview? We've, talk, we've talked uh, about just um, medical news stories in general, stuff about the vaccine, ethical scenarios. I had a few interview questions chucked at me as if I was getting grilled like it was a real interview. Um, so just like, yeah, so whatever you guys have, um, drop them below and I'll try my best to answer them. Hopefully. Okie dokie. So do you have any tips for building your CV from now until I apply to uni? That's a really good question, um, Abner. So the CV slash personal statement is what you'd be looking at, kind of both of them. And what I'd say is, yes, um, I do have a few tips, um, hopefully, for you guys. Um, and those few tips include basically getting as much experience as possible in whichever field, because you don't know what might help you. So at the beginning, it is very difficult, especially the younger you are, to get experience in clinical settings. And generally, because under 18s, you find it difficult to get um, set, um help with stuff like that. So that's why people look at allied healthcare professionals, um, allied healthcare services, whether that be in the caring service or like in hospice care, in the elderly care homes and stuff, just do volunteering there if that's possible. Um, or, or like working in a charity shop or working part-time, tutoring, things like that. Just any opportunity will add to your CV of some way. And the reason why I say that is because I can look back on it and say how many transferable skills that I've gotten from doing other roles outside of medicine um, that I can actually directly apply to my future life as a doctor, let alone as a medical student. Um, so for example, if you have a part-time job, let's say part-time job in a sweet shop, for example, like as simple as that in a corner shop, like it, that's, pretty, that's pretty good for you because you can, be, so you can um, have responsibility over your own money, you're earning um, uh, money for yourself as, and being autonomous you are um, managing your time and workload with your studies. Um, so therefore, the person on the other side of the table interviewing you knows that you're someone who can work with, uh, with a few things going on and you're, quite, um, you're, you're kind of maturing. Like these are few things that you can take from just, um, uh, just, uh, just a part-time job, for example. So if you do other things on top, that's great. And these are the transitional skills that people are looking for. Abna, I hope I've been able to answer your question there to a good extent. If you have any follow-ups, do let me know. Um, good. So I've got a question from Olivia. Olivia goes, what uh, about UCAT advice? Question mark. Anything more specific on that? But I will try and open up. But um, so before. So first of all, with the UCAT stuff, um, I've spoken quite at length about UCAT just tips in general, how to prepare for it. We, we say wait for like spend about a month preparing for it. Um, and like gradually build up the workload for it. Um, we talked about resources that you can use and things like Medify as a resource. We've spoken about it in loads of live sessions previously. So if you want to look more in depth of what I've said, do look back on our few live sessions and um, hopefully we can help you out. Anything more specific in terms of UCAT question, please do drop, let me know. I did hate that exam a lot, um, but uh, yeah, I think we all have to do it. We get it done. Hopefully we do as well, well as we can and then we move. Um, Hey, so we've got aspiring another aspiring medic joining us. Thanks for joining another aspiring medic. It's good to see you again. Um, yeah, as usual, drop your questions below and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so the next question I have, 
Okay, so we've got okay, so with the Med Mentor Clinic, we're also live on um on our Facebook channel, on Twitter, on our website, um, on our YouTube. So please do have a look at all our other platforms and especially our Med Mentor website. So hopefully you can get you guys can get some help from the rest of the Med Mentor team that work really hard to bring you all the resources, the articles, the posts and everything. Um, so yeah, do have a look um, and thanks guys for your support. Do share us with, with your friends and people that you know applying to med school. Hopefully we can be a benefit to them, okay? Um, I think what I've realized is that I haven't introduced myself. So um, my name is Tafsir. I'm a final year medical student at UCL. I've been, um, I've, I've been mentoring um, kids in year 12 and 13 to get into med school for the last six years. I've run two or three summer schools on how to get into med school previously at UCL. Um, and I've also interviewed um, on the UCL uh, medical school interview panel as well. So I have a few insights on that type of stuff as well on top of that. So yeah, ask me any questions you guys like and I'll try my best answer. So Olivia has asked how much work, ex how much experience is genuinely needed to get into med school? That's a very good question. So I'd say, honestly, as much as you can um, fit time in for and as many opportunities you can get, um, it's more, it's, it's, it's more like a tick box for specific experiences. Um, and then the other stuff is, um, the other stuff, it basically comes down to your reflections. So like, so for example, I only spent half a day at a hospital, right? But you don't have to say you spent half a day or like one day only or whatever. You, you just state your experience and you say what you got from it. But in that half, half a day that I spent in a hospital, it was so hard to get work experience at these places under 18. I, I, I found out two or three key insights that I was able to slot into my personal statement and I could say I did that whilst on work experience. So it's more what you get from it and how much you can kind of build on it on your personal statement. I think it's, it is very important. Um, it's less, less quantity, more like quality of the work experience that you get in terms of like, um, in terms of like different sectors, different skills, different reflections that you can get from it. So myself i think i went a bit overboard with work experiences i think i got like at the end of it like 10 or 11 work experience or volunteer roles in general only half a day was spent in a hospital bear in mind right the other one that i had was in a gp surgery that was really beneficial to me one was half of the week i was in um i was in working in the reception and the other half the gp was kind enough to kind of teach me a few things and bring me in, in a few consultations after permission so what I'd say is like even like half a day in a GP surgery, talking to a GP and seeing one or two patients, I learned huge amounts. Um, so it's like those type of things. So oh, like all in all, I had loads of work experiences like as a list, but m not many of them were more than half one day or a week, like week maximum. Um, so I'll list what I had. And this is what I'd recommend you kind of like aspire to do. And like, if you don't make all of them, that's more than fine. Like, I know people with half what I did um, and still got in. And that's not an issue. It's what you reflect on. So like I did a work experience at a hospital, at a GP practice. I did work experience at optometrist, um, uh, optician, sorry, with an optometrist, rather than like in a pharmacy with being like an allied healthcare professional. I did work experience at a hospice. I did work experience in a youth club for kids who had... Um, uh, learning difficulties and autism. Um, I volunteered um, for like local, a local charity. Um, and like, there's a whole host of other things my friends did. Like they volunteered at elderly care homes and volunteered for other organizations, worked in shops. Um, some people um, tutored. Um, and then again, other experiences include stuff like I went to a summer school, um, uh, the unique summer school, and that was really beneficial to me. Um, I then did work experience at a research laboratory, which is something very different that many people don't have on a work experience. However, there's so many research laboratories and universities across the country that you can get experience from. So I just shadowed like a master's student or a PhD student working on the science projects and like experiments and stuff. So those are opportunities that you can go for. Um, I did some uh, volunteering with the air cadets and stuff. Um, but yeah, those are just like things that I did half because I was someone who was very keen and involved in things. And the other half is because I knew it would look good on my CV or personal statement. And I'd be able to use translatable um, skills with that. And I was able to write about it. Uh, Olivia, uh, let me know if I've been able to answer your question there. I think I said a lot of it. Um, I work, I did work experience at our hospice as well. So all this stuff. 
Um, great. Thank you very much, another aspiring medic, dropping your little gems. Absolutely amazing. So I only I only had half a day in the hospital as well, but I was able to talk about it in my personal statement. I interviewed extensively, and the rest of my work experience were mainly virtual. Another aspiring medic. That's brilliant. I think for these cohorts of years, I think you guys are going to have much less work experience than like previous years and a lot more will it will be virtual and just things like that you do like your you read or you listen to podcasts or you watch something about to do with medicine um even participating in med mentor uk's like weekly live clinics is something you could talk about in a personal statement like these are all experiences and these are things that i would encourage you guys to kind of think more about it's more the, these guys want to see the admissions tutors want to see that you're being inquisitive about medicine that you want to that you know what you're kind of getting yourself in for um you're not going in blindly you know what um what to expect maybe in the next couple of months to a year as a medical student these are things they're looking for so bear that in mind okay <coughs> so the other thing that i've gotten from um brilliant that's great thank you guys so much so i've got another question in the comments and that is from Enas. Um, uh, Enas, do you want to give us a little wave? Hey, thanks for your question. Will you be disadvantaged if you don't do three sciences when applying to medicine? No, you won't. Um, I'm presuming this is in GCSEs or is this in A-levels? If you, you definitely won't be disadvantaged if you do three sciences in A-levels, if you don't do it, sorry. Um, I think the only one that's uh, required is chemistry and the rest is like, um, uh, either you have to, a lot of universities say you have either have to do biology or maths. Some universities, one or two, a few do require biology with chemistry, uh, but then the rest, um, they don't have anything else. Um, the other third subject can be anything else um, that they recommend. Again, I'd say look at the med school, med, med school um, council website, uh, the official website, and then they have a document of what um, med schools look for, for um, a level and GCSE subjects, but more than that, A level subjects. And ask, um, can you let me know if um, if you guys, if you are talking about A level or GCSE, just to clarify, and then I might refine the answer if need be. Okie dokie. Great. Hi guys. Thank you guys for joining. Do let me know if you have any questions about the med school applications process. If you have any comments that you guys want to add, feel free to drop them below as well. Just like um, another aspiring medic is doing after getting the offer themselves. Yes, about A-levels, perfect, so that's great. So what I said is um, true for A-levels. I, I don't know what I would have done if I did biology, chemistry, maths for A-levels, like, I would have gone crazy. Uh, way too much science. Um, so, um, and physics is very difficult, so you're fine. Yeah. You're very welcome, Nas. No worries, brilliant. Okay, we've got more questions coming in. So, all right, so we've been able to go through and ask this question, which is great. And the next question we'll go for is Afifa. Um, Afifa goes personal statement advice. Um, uh, I th it, Could you be any... Okay, okay, that's fine. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right, you've clarified your question. Can I get a personal statement advice? As I have no idea where to start. Hey, Afifa, do you want to give us a little wave um, so that we know you're there? Um, so, where do we start? Okay, so I wouldn't start thinking about a personal statement until I'm um, like at the end of year 12 after my mock exams um, and then start of year 13 is when you probably do it like properly in September is when I kind of did all my personal statement work, did loads of drafts and then submitted it. Um, what I'd say in anticipation for that, I would um, reflect on any experiences that I did. Um, and I, you, I, I like, crept, like kept a diary of the experiences, what I learned or saw or did, and then what I reflected on that, so that I wouldn't forgot, forget when it comes to the point that I have to talk about it in a personal statement, like one or two years down the line. That really is beneficial, and I put it in bullet point format. I just had a little notebook, and I wrote everything down. So that's something I'd say is where to start with building your experiences and reflecting on things, because if you have a work experience, let's say at the end of year 11, you're writing your um, your personal statement in like one and a half to two years time after that that's a very long time and that you won't remember what's been going on like no matter how good your memory is so this is something I'd recommend so then that would be a good starting process with your personal statement kind of I sat there and on a document I just listed out every single experience that I've done um, and then I started reflecting on little things that I did 
um, or I learned, um, and I just expanded on it, and I wrote like page, like uh, a couple, like a like a couple of lines on each one of like specific experiences or what I learned or what I enjoyed or not, and then from that I started thinking of it in a more structured way with all the content there in bullet point format in front of me in a Word document. I then started to think, oh, which experience might link to another that that would help the personal statement flow. So, for example, if I did work experience at GP practice. Um, but then I did work experience at a research lab. How can I link those two together? Um, is what I was thinking in my head in a person in a paragraph in a personal statement, and see if there's any links. And if there is, then I would put them together and I start writing. More than anything, I think everyone starts with the structure with why I want to do medicine first line. And I went in straight for my work experience at a GP practice. I reflected on that, linked it to something else that I learned, and then I carried it on. I did a work ex I did a paragraph on like something that I was really interested in medicine, which was oncology. I went to summer schools about it. I did some research projects on it. I did loads of stuff like that. So that was a clear theme of one of my other paragraphs. Um, another paragraph at the end was about extracurriculars. So th this is how I structured it. And as I structured it, I kind of filled in the holes and I started typing out. I did like 56 drafts of my personal statement or something. So just, just start, just write a huge word document of whatever you want to write. Um, and then after that, you can refine it and edit it as you go along. Afifa, I hope that's helped. Please let me know if it has or hasn't. And if you've got anything else, let me know. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Hey guys, thank you guys for joining. Please keep the questions coming in. So um, hopefully we can help you guys out. Hey Anna, so yes, I provisionally think they do. Um, however, I think um, this is a very like specific uh, question that would be best um, calling the admissions department of UCL up about. Um, the, the phone number for the admissions department is on the UCL Med School um, uh, web, websites, um, like address stuff. So like just call them up and ask them specifically if there's anything for that. I do know they provide a, a, a reduced entry requirement for people who are from widening participation backgrounds as long as you fill that criteria, you'll be allowed that type of offer. So do have a look on that website. And that's the same for all medical schools that you apply to. Look at their websites to see what their participation, widening participation criteria is. If you meet it, then take that reduced offer because it just guarantees you uh, more, but is more like it just increases your likelihood of getting in and reduces your stress because the aim of that um, lower offer um, is to kind of level the playing field because it's not the same thing. All right, great, great, great. That's a good questions, guys. Thanks for chucking them on. Puma, hey, Amy. Thanks. Uh, give us a little hello. So, seven o'clock. So, drop them below on the question cards, um, and hopefully, we can help you out as much as possible. So, if you guys go on the Med Mentor website, we've got loads of blog posts about um, personal statements, about UCAT, and things like that. So, um, have a look and hopefully those start helping you out as well that's a good place to start and then you can come to our q a sessions and ask anything more specifically um our med mentor team work really really hard and they do an amazing job with the content we put out there so please do share it with everyone that you can do with as well all right cool so um last last week we talked about um something that was on the cards for a little while and that was kind of like what what's the point of going through med school like what do you aim for at the end of it and i think it's it's worth bearing in mind for people applying for med school that when you're applying for med school and writing a personal statement or talking about an interview you are applying to be a medical student and a future doctor and that's why the personal statement and interviews are very tricky and difficult because effectively at the age of 17 you're applying for a job as well as a place at university, which is why things are so difficult and why um, things can overlap and stuff like that. So in my head, I think the way I tell my mentees to look at it these days is that what will help me to become a good medical student and therefore a good doctor in the future, because um, you don't want to like jump the gun. You don't go from year 13 to being a doctor. Um, you don't go to being like a student doctor and you've got five or six years to develop the acumen to do something even better. Um, and I think, 
those five or six years are there for growth. So in a personal statement or interview, you don't have to say, oh, my communication skills are excellent. And you can say, yeah, it's good. It's a good start off point and you've got room to grow. And that's the way you should be approaching these kind of things. Um, less arrogance, more kind of like being genuine about what's going on. So that's it. Um, that's just something I've got. Hey, Amy. So Amy's just catching up with us. So busy cramming for a chem test. That sounds about right. It's A-levels after all. Um, so many cram sessions. But I thought I'd use this as a uh, as a brain break. How are you guys? It's been like two weeks. What's new? Uh, good. So um, what's new with us? Um, I'm guessing, yes, chem is not fun. Another aspiring medic. I did not enjoy it. You'll be happy to hear there is no chemistry in medicine. And that's what I love. However, chemistry has got incredible analytical and evaluation skills that you need to use in medicine um so it's most transferable skills rather than context skills but you'll see that when it comes to it and i like those transferable skills when applied to the human biology i guess and oh amazing hey another aspiring medic congratulations on another offer got it from liverpool this time so i i remember you had enough from cardiff and now you got off from liverpool uh waiting on leicester uh, where are you going for university? Congratulations, that's amazing, amazing, amazing news. I'm just going to screenshot that for the Med Mentor team to, uh, because we absolutely love it. Absolutely love um, our, our people getting offers uh, to be future doctors. Um, your hard work has paid off. How are you feeling? How are you feeling in others, Fry Medic? Is it just another offer, just another thing? Um, cool. Liverpool is an amazing university, uh, amazing city as well. Uh, great place to go to university and their campus is incredible. I was there this time last year for a meeting with one of uh, the people at the Liverpool School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and that's great as well because you have links to them right on your campus. Um, but yeah, wicked, wicked, wicked. I love chem but do I understand it? Absolutely not. Well, at least you love it because I didn't understand it and I didn't love it. So it is what it is. I think it's a shame that... Um, for med school that chemistry is such a madness like it's such a important um requirement um i definitely would have rather have done like a humanities or uh, something like pure uh, like um pure maths or something or like further maths that would have been nice but it's, it is what it is um yes hard work has paid off and this is what we're talking about guys work hard and it it will hopefully pay off and just like how another aspiring medic has got offers um great news Cardiff is your first choice, perfect. Cardiff is amazing. Um, well, this is great. I mean, I only had one off for med school and I just about got it. So you guys are doing amazing stuff and I can't wait to see you guys help the next generation get into med school in the next few years, which will be great to see. Okie dokie. So uh, I've got a very interesting, interesting, uh, another aspiring medic. Where do you get these questions from? Honestly, uh, I love it. So. You tell me um, uh, as well. So, so far, what you know about curriculums, like I know Cardiff has an amazing new curriculum uh, that was new for my year, but not new for you guys. I think the K20 or not K20, something, C20 something curriculum. Um, so that curriculum was like very new at the time when they brought it out, integrated medicine with, um, sci with like the preclinical side of science. Um, so like, yeah, that was wicked. Do you have anything that you'd like to add to med school curriculum if you were the dean? My answer to that is um, yes, I know what I would add to the curriculum and it'd be two things. Um, one that's very a hot, very much a hot topic that we've talked about before is medical technology. Um, I think we need, I think medicine is probably the last industry um, in last industry to get uh, medical technologies involved in, in their work. Um, I think like if you look at it, it's, it's entrenched all other aspects of society and I think health is the last one and it's about to start now um, and it has already begun and we need to become technologically literate so that we can work with the future developments and we can push for those future developments as well um, so that we don't have old school doctors. I think a lot of medics that I know in my like year groups and years below are becoming very technologically literate by their own proactiveness and their own chance and working extra hard to do that because they don't have the necessary facility, whether that be time outside of med school or uh, the cost of things or courses or having to join societies. When I think that's good, but at this point, I think we should have a base level 
that um, med school should be teaching. It's quite interesting, actually. So I think a lot more universities are thinking of this already. Um, Queen Mary and the Barts University had um, medical technology stuff kind of um, in, entrenched in their curriculum um, for the last few years already. So they, they are taught on like as a module on that stuff. We at UCL now have a module called Do a doctor as a data scientist, which is something that uses data science um, linked to med tech to then um, think about statistics and like probabilities and stuff like that. We also have now student selected components. So like um, optional modules in like first year of university and second year where you can do like coding um, and learn beginners coding through university as part of your curriculum. So these are things that the people are thinking about. BSCs have kind of exploded, especially in London, um, with now more BSCs to do with computer sciences, medical physics, um, like you name it. There's loads of technology based now uh, BSCs out there as well for medics to take up. So this is something that um, uh, I think is slowly being integrated into the curriculum at a good pace, but something I would definitely encourage. Yes, it's good to hear that uh, Medtech is amazing. The second thing I'll come back to. You. So, yes, yeah, so yes, I'm going, I'm looking forward to working with the new generation of healthcare professionals. Racial diversity is a huge thing. I incorporate more. Wow. That's a very good point. And I think um, a very timely point as well. Um, and tells you a lot about um, medicine as well. As much as the NHS is a diverse population um, as a workforce, it is, um, it is, it still got its flaws um, uh, of which we have we are finding out more and more ever since um, uh, kind of the Black Lives Matters uh, Matter movement over the last few years, and what we're finding more is discrimination and um, things like things that you shouldn't be experiencing in a in a workplace, and a lot also on top of that about institutional racism, uh, just because of the fact that the NHS is a very old old institute and um, it needs um, it needs change. And that's through the workforce, um, taking on good habits and having the thought process to think about change. Um, so that's exactly it. We need to talk about racial diversity more. We need to have more debates about it um, and how to kind of um, kind of improve it um, from our workforce standing rather than just a top down approach. And I think that's a great idea and something that you should definitely be working on, hopefully, when you're in med school um, and working around you, which will be great. And the other thing that I thought that would be good to include in a um, med school curriculum would be more about lifestyle medicine, more about how um, kind of the cushy side of medicine really works. So uh, not the cushy, more like um, so things like well-being practices, how that makes a difference to a patient. Let's talk about food and lifestyle. So like um, go doing exercise, how how much, how often, how do people start, how do you get them to go above and motivate them to do more. Like this is something that is entrenched with our clinical communication skills modules. However, I think it should be more emphasized. And uh, we also have loads of stuff now. Uh, we need to have more stuff on nutrition and food and healthy eating um, on a more higher standard level. And I've been seeing that that's required more and more from healthcare professionals because a lot of our um, underlying health problems do come down to obesity and um, nutritional problems. Um, especially in this modern age, and I think it's a shame that we're uh, that we're not taught enough about it, and hence why there's been a movement recently um, from in the last few years, especially promoted by um, hey, Dr. Hazel Wallace, who's the food medic, and um, sit for example at UCL now we have a UCL um, li uh, lifestyle um, medicine kind of society. Um, we've got lifestyle medicine incorporated into our modules now as well, uh, where we talk, where we learn how to kind of cook nutritional meals. Um, and it's like really cool. It's really nice. And it's something that's practical and worthwhile for your patients and yourself. So that's great to know. All right. So Amy has said our same reducing racism and ethnic disparities one, was one of my inspirations for med. Um, and although it's not a reason to do med, it's definitely something I want to achieve in my own clinic, theatre, etc. Amy, that sounds like a great idea. And it's good to have that inspiration behind you. Um, and that will hopefully motivate you. I think it's really important for patients to have people that are that reflect their um, their values or their kind of like heritage as well within a healthcare system. Show so it so it shows representation and 
sometimes other people will like to, will uh, will be more likely to kind of relate to um, a patient uh, than others. So I think it's really important that we have that diversity um, because that's what that should be reflected by our patient population as well, which is great. Amy, absolutely, I agree. Um, there's not one kind of patient, so the curriculum shouldn't focus on one or two types of patients, exactly. And that's um, something I think Malone, um, who's on Instagram and like all over uh, the media right now, kind of championing this um, this kind of movement and this thought process about kind of changing our curriculum to include, to include the diversity of our patient workload as well, which I think is really important. And I have, after going through six years of medicine, it's quite interesting that I, don't, I haven't seen many things on uh, many like conditions on black skin or darker skin, even my own skin. Like I don't have any pictures in my notes that would reflect anything of my own like dark skin. Um, uh, so it tells you a lot about how much we need to do still. Um, and Malone is um, someone who epitomizes, I think, how you can be a student. So not, not someone that senior, but just a student with, uh, with, a, with uh, logical arguments and a great voice to kind of enforce change and that's um, that's what you guys should aspire to do and I think what I thought of back in year 12 and 13 is that if anything I want to do is that if there's anything I want to do I have to wait until like I'm a full-on adult and I've got a job that where I'm a consultant or something and then I can bring about change what I've realized is that um, after, as soon as you are a student and you have time and you have that passion there's so, there's loads of things you can do with that um, that you'll be surprised how much influence you have and especially going into a field like medicine, um, you do have uh, credibility to your name being someone who is a medic um, and someone who uh, is shown in like in the public lifestyle to have integrity, responsibility, someone who's quite uh, hopefully mature, things like that. And these things are good to hold like um, and has someone who has trust with the public. And those are things that are important to use kind of to benefit uh, you, you with things that you want to aspire to do which is exactly it. I think it was like, um, I remember when I was applying for med school, there was like a straw poll of who do you trust as like professionals? I think the worst was politicians and the best was like doctors. Um, and so that tells you a lot uh, about it. And for sure, it's the fact that I, it's surface level two, like a dark person of color is not going to show redness for erythema and the EGFR is awful too. I know it's preferred, but it's not the best that Black versus non-black is such a big part of the equation. Yes, I think it's um, those are interesting debates to have and stuff that we are still trying to get our head around as well uh, on how to kind of overcome these problems that are very much institutional and based on the world of science, which um, hasn't done, which is a lot, especially our type of medicine is definitely based on the Western side. And um, these are these are the conversations we need to have because uh, a lot of these experiments that we do or like um, data that we gather is from people from, uh, from with white skin or like a Caucasian background and um, therefore it's not always reliable to extrapolate that to other ethnicities especially with such differences I think. Guys thank you very much for your comments it's very humbling to hear um, you guys who are so young um, thinking about these things and being quite passionate about it and I'd encourage you guys to keep that passion on because I can see you guys will do great things if you do. And we need that. I, we need that energy and that passion because a lot of the times when you're in an institution and things aren't going well uh, around you or the way you see it, I think you can kind of be beaten down by it and then kind of lose your way a little bit or give up. You guys got to remember as fresh medical students in the next years or two, you're going to have a lot more energy than everyone else around you. And hopefully, therefore, you can use that to make that difference. So don't forget how important you guys are, please. Don't underestimate yourself. All right, good stuff, good stuff. All right, we've got um, we've got other questions coming in that are a little bit different. Um, so Malika has asked, is it harder than A-levels? What is harder than A-levels? Med school, yes, med school is definitely hard, harder than A-levels, um, if that was your question. <laughs> I think I told the guys here before that um, I remember, you know how you go through chapters of your A-level biology textbook or something? Like like my biology textbook had like eight or nine chapters um, and that was everything we were going to cover that year. Um, and I remember we'd gone through basically one chapter's worth of content in the first 10 minutes of our second lecture of med school. Like it's like, it's crazy the differences. So um, 
yes, it is harder than A-levels. It's more the quantity that you have to learn rather than the, in, the depth of science. But yeah, definitely the quantity of workload increases vastly. Um, but obviously, there's ways to go around it and get yourself uh, through it. So that's something to think about. Malika, if you have a follow-up question, let me know. Um, Okie dokie. So Roshan goes, his work is amazing and has already made changes on the NHS Choices website and in changing what questions get asked by emergency services to reflect how conditions can manifest on various skin tones. Wow. Uh, Roshan, thank you for that insight. Only someone who works in healthcare would be knowing this much information and that's great to see. Um, so yeah, you can inspire change even by being so young or as a medical student. And that's something to think about, guys. Great stuff, great stuff. All right, thanks for joining us, Roshin. How are you doing today? Um, how's the last week been? Have you been taking up shifts or have you been chilling um, uh, before you start university? Do you guys have any questions about university, starting university, uh, social stuff? or like to do with friends and like uh, accommodation stuff, practical things, lectures, taking notes, whatever you call it. If you guys have any type of questions like that, we're here to help you guys here as well. Um, I'll be happy to help and it'll help me reminisce my first few years of med school. Yeah. I think um, interesting topic, maybe, maybe we can talk about for next week. I think was, um, so a few of my friends last week uh, and I, we were talking, uh, we were reflecting on our six years of med school. So obviously there's amazing parts of med school that we've had and we've looked back on good memories, but we also uh, started to remember uh, some of the not so great times that we had at med school and the stresses that we've had. And it was, um, it was very nice to kind of talk out loud about it. So I think um, we can definitely talk about kind of the bad sides of med school, medicine in general, and kind of strategies to overcome it or thing, or just insights just Make you guys aware of what you've got yourself in for, I guess, after seeing it the other side. Oh my God, Amy, I didn't even realise that was your question. So yeah, your question is, is there anything you hate, hate, hate about UCL or med school? Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a quite a common thing. You do hate the exams and the way they are, um, the exams and the way, so... I really hate the exams because I get really stressed out for them because they, uh, they, there's a lot of weight in them. So, for example, at UCL, if you fail one of the exams, you have to resit all the exams that year um, at a later sitting. Sometimes in clinical years, you have to retake the entire year if you if you fail like one paper. I think failure has always um, has driven me through med school uh, for better or for worse. I think for definitely worse. I think that's um, that's really played. A, uh, quite an like quite a stressful uh, component in my life. Um, I've been hopefully able to deal with it to an extent, but it doesn't uh, take away from the fact that it is very much high stress um, when it comes to that. I think before I started med school, um, I think I was more worried about um, yes the rant about UCL exams incoming. Um, I think before I started med school, I was more worried about um, being a doctor and um, the stresses, high stress situations you'd be in that. But obviously as a med student, you don't have that responsibility. Even as an F1 in your first year as a doctor, you shouldn't have that responsibility because medicine is made so that you have seniors above you to help you. That's a flip side that I thought I would really hate, that, um, that high stress situation. But actually you don't make any life or death decisions because that's not how the system works. The system works so you have um, safety nets in place. So even at the end of six years of med school, I, I'm like I know I'm a, I hopefully it will be a safe doctor by knowing that I will be I will call for help when things are out that I can't help anymore with a patient in need um, especially in an emergency scenario so that's good is there anything else that you hate 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 about UCL med school I think in general med school is just tough I think med school is just a lot of information that you have to work through it's a lot of studying I think I really enjoyed studying when I was oh what on earth yeah, I enjoyed studying when I was like 15 or 16 when I didn't think of anything apart from kind of education that was like the important thing to get you out. But I think when you go through education for so long, you, I mean, you do realise that there's more to life than just studying long hours every day. Um, and it's like one of those things like, you know, those quotes that come to you like, oh, um, make every day worthwhile. Um, you can't really make every day worthwhile when you've got like finals exams coming up in one month. Like you can, you have to just study and just make sure you put those hours there. And 
like it's not an amazing day with loads of stuff going on and exciting moving around and achieving loads of things it's just a very much a slog to get through the studying to then do exams um and then that's a different type of reward because obviously when you pass and you get through it all it's like wow all that work it paid off and obviously the flip side is like the day your results come out and you've now cast to go into the next year of med school and you're one year close to being a doctor you realize how hard you worked and therefore the euphoria is is equivalent to how hard you have worked um so everything has a flip side i realize one thing in med school is that as many low points there as there are hopefully there are as many high points um but yeah um i think a lot of people do this is not from my point of view but other people's points of view i think people really do hate how competitive med school is um i think I think in the last few years I started to question um I I I I started being frustrated of how competitive medicine was kind of pushing me to be or like trying to make me um uh, something that I didn't kind of like because I was someone who wanted to be kind of yeah I think it just competition within you I think I remember I was always the type of person that oh I'm just competing against myself and no one else and that's the way I approach med school as well which really helped me out especially in the first few years um but i think what medicine kept trying to push me to do is try and be competitive against everyone else because at the end of the day we get ranked against everyone else to get our job offers to get uh, to get into the deaneries to then get specialty jobs and stuff like that um so yeah that's something um i wouldn't aim i really wouldn't worry about redoing the year um or like failing i honestly it's like 1% of like all med students probably in the country kind of drop out of med school and that's half because there was just extenuating circumstances that people have had or half because they just didn't want to do medicine again so that's like one in like 100 medics across the country probably even much less than that probably probably like 0.05% um i think at ucl things have already have obviously changed because there's um there's loads of policies in place with covid to prevent people being failed but i do remember in our first and second year of ucl med school in preclinical years like 25% of our year group failed um the exams in the first sitting and then they had to reset like a month later so they didn't reset the year but reset the exams a month later in the summer holiday um and then that same there was another 25% in the second year and that kind of echoed through and i think what happened is that ucl ucl's exams were very much more difficult like they jumped in the last few years in terms of how difficult they were because they were trying to test us to be kind of better doctors in the future or something um and those exams were really really tough and compared to how much to the level we were learning at we thought um but yeah that's what happened that was in first year second year i think by the time you get to clinical years it's a much less you're much less likely to be kind of chucked out of med school or like or failed um because um the un- the university and the government spend a lot of money to train medical students so they don't want you to fail they really do want you to stay because it, i think it costs like 66000 pounds roughly per year for a medical student to be taught because of all the hospital fees and the med student and university fees so you're paying 9000 by the by the rest of the, the government is paying the rest of it or the nhs so clearly they really want to invest in you and want you to pass so do know that once you're in the system is harder to get out and fail than it is to stay and they do everything they can to keep you in the system that's just a perspective and something that i need to always bear in mind and i did as well which really helped me out um yeah in terms of actually redoing a year i don't think it's more than like a couple of people out of like hundreds of people that re- end up redoing an entire year because they fail like if you work consistently and you do the things that you need to do you are normally more than fine so that's how it works i think i hope that has helped um i don't I, yeah yeah exam rant over but um these are things you can look forward to in the next years to come i wouldn't stress about it in the first term especially at university I think worry about it much later on um enjoy yourself before that and there's plenty of time that's the kind of silver lining to all of this is that as much as things were difficult in med school there were so many amazing times that i had not necessarily to do with the content that you're covering or something but more the friends you make the societies the opportunities that come with it things you get involved with like it is amazing um so it's good to try and balance as much as you can okie dokie so i've got other questions coming in um i okay so i've got a question from al 
Al X S H. Um, hey, do you want to give us a little wave? So, how are you meant to know if medicine is for you? You need to. If medicine is for you, I would say uh, you 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 can only know that by experiencing it, and that's why loads of people get work experience. That's why loads of people read about medicines and topics and like uh, book genres about it and listen to podcasts about it and see if you are actually inquisitive and enjoy what they're talking about as the doctors or what you see on work experience. Um, for me, more than anything else, it was that patient interaction. Like I really loved using my communication skills to try and help people. And for me, that was the reason why I wanted to get into medicine because I didn't think there was a career like it. I also thought that it combined loads of different subjects that I learned at school and like applied it in its own different way in medicine. Obviously with biology being the main forefront of it, human biology, but loads of other things encompassing it, like the psychology of health, uh, of like your patients, like um, learning about sociology and family dynamics, learning about economics of healthcare systems. These are all things that you can kind of use as a future doctor, as a med school. So I really liked how it encompassed loads of other subjects. Obviously, you then have to try and then get the experiences and then the grades to try and get it. So it's one of those things. First of all, see if you are you have you are capable of staying in education for another five to six years for a subject. And the way you do that is by doing these, like finding out if you're interested or not. Otherwise, five to six years on a subject that you're not interested in will be a slog. It will be very difficult for you. And so therefore you need that you need to find out if it's more for you before you go. All right. I hope that's helped. All right. Next question I have. All right, guys, we've got about 15 minutes. So get your questions in um, and I'll um, aim to answer them before we head off. Thank you guys for joining in. Really appreciate it. Um, if you guys haven't uh, taken part already, do give us a hello to show us um, who's involved in all of this stuff. Um, I'd like to say Al, Al, uh, Alex SH, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, happy to help. Um, hey, Grace. So um, I'm going to save this as a Insta live video. Um, and I have already given tips for UCAT prep at the start of the video and in previous Insta lives. So just go to the start of the video when I've saved this in about 15 minutes and you'll find out UCAT prep tips. All right. Another aspiring medic, um, which specialties are the easiest to have a good work-life balance in your opinion and to your knowledge? Hey, that's a really good grown-up question that I did not think of asking people um, when I applied for med school. Um, so I remember thinking that before applying to med school, obviously you're so busy studying all the time and knowing that the way you getting good grades and being on top of your work will, end, will get you the goal of getting into med school. But then when you get into med school, you realize there's more to that in life. Um, so I think, so I thought at first, oh my God, I forget work-life balance. Life should be work, 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 which is naive of me in first year of university. And then I tasted um, normal life and how good it is to just um, have fun um, and enjoy yourself, which you should do. And I now realize work-life balance is really important. And hence I've really looked into it a lot. I've asked loads of people. And I think this is something you should ask. So every time I've been on... Um, placement with in a different specialty I do ask the doctors about like what conferences they're going to what they're working on how they enjoyed their specialty um or what they like about it and I like and I love asking them how's your work-life balance like are you able to have your family are you able to have friends are you able to have time for things that are outside of medicine do you want to do that and uh and these are questions that uh, doctors love answering as well because you're getting to know them so what I'd encourage everyone to do is definitely when you're on work experience, when you're on placement, to ask these ex these questions and all doctors will be happy to answer them. Um, from my understanding, I think um, when it comes to uh, medicine, there's kind of like three different, three or four different domains you can go into. You can go on uh, to a specialties under medicine, which is just like a general medicine specialty stuff that you can do like respiratory, cardiology, all of that stuff. Then the other thing is surgery. Um, which is purely like surgical jobs. Um, like let's say if you do have orthopedics, that's a surgery job, not something that's medicine related because you're doing operations and you're, you're looking look after patients like that. Um, and then the third one is more like primary healthcare, like GP. There's also psychiatry as the fourth different type of option. And both of GP and psychiatry work in the community. What I found out is that GP and psychiatry um, definitely have better hours than being in hospital medicine in general. Um, 
not to say that you can't have work life balance and work um part time through training in some certain some special circumstances or things like that but what i've seen is that yes um gps do do like a lot of uh, people are appeal like gp appeals to them because of the work life balance um however it's not as 9 to 5 job as you think it is when i've seen gps most of them do work long long hours of like 10 to 12 hour days however obviously you do have flexibility of um what type of job do you take up and um and you're not so much in the big nhs system you're in you're part of a gp system within the nhs so you can be part time if you like you can take some time out of training or like as a gp you can do locums like things like that so gp definitely is something that people say work life balance is good however there are caveats to that and things are kind of getting worse with that um and it will be interesting to see where we are with that psychiatry is something that is traditionally seen as a 9 to 5 job um because there's not many emergencies you do have on call hours and i think this is what um on call is something when you're when you have to be at the hospital over the nights or on the weekends or in the evenings and those are kind of unsociable hours where you where then um the work life balance kind of starts tipping to more work and i think that's what in the hospital is more required of you just because you have to take care of your patients 24 hours a day 7 days a week and um that's what the beauty of hospital medicine is and some people really love that and find their way around work life balance i think what was interesting is ane loads of people used to tell me and i remember going to talks about doctors who were in ane um and that i think that seemed to have the worst work life balance out of all of them um however in the last few years and especially in the last few training programs they've started to kind of change that with the rota systems so like let's say if they are they're working four days a week night shifts they then have four or five days off it depends on the hospital but it's like it's a good, like is is some like any has a lot more on social hours but then now they're trying to offset that especially through training to make things easier for people to become any doctors for example um i think do you th- okay so your follow up question another spy medic was do you think the rise of virtual consultations might help with the gp hours um so i did virtual consultations and phone call phone call consultations consultations as part of my placement a couple of months ago and the e consults definitely made things quicker um phone calls definitely made things um phone calls did actually make things quicker but the e consults themselves did so for example if someone just wants to get a repeat prescription and the gp already knows about it um and knows them very well and just ask one or two questions via text um and then they reply and then that's it they prescribe helps a lot and it makes it convenient however i don't think it is enough to change the hours 10 minute consultation times are really not enough for gps i think it's going to be interesting to see where that goes i think that's where the time pressure comes you're seeing so many patients in a day is crazy um and you're seeing literally uh, you could be seeing up to 100 in one day as a gp which is insane um the other things in medicine that i know are so the less medical emergencies you have the better your work life balance in terms of like on social hours so ent ear nose and throat ophthalmology um is known notoriously to have been, for having really good work life balance whilst working in a hospital um and the other one dermatology but because they all have such great work life balances um they have such competitive um application rates doesn't mean you're not going to get in uh, it just means that that's what appeals to a lot of people and then they go for it so those are very much more 9 to 5 jobs the uh, the thing that i would say definitely does not have a great work life balance i think is quite commonly known as surgery and that is because as a surgeon it's kind of like unspoken uh, but unspoken of but known that you have to work even outside your working hours and put in extra curricular hours basically in logging surgeries especially as a junior because you need to have that portfolio portfolio to stand out amongst other candidates is really really competitive to get the surgical post that you want um and hence why the work life balance even if your hours in hospital are normal and fine um even though you have loads of on calls and shifts you then have to do extra work on top extra surgeries extra portfolio requirements extra teaching um extra conferences to go to extra learning and those are the reasons why work life balance is so tricky in medicine in general um let alone in surgery so these are all things that you start learning more and more about i think it's much more than just oh how long am i in the hospital or in the gp practice it's also about what do i need to do on top of my work to kind of progress in my work 
So for example, in some specialties, you have to do an exam every year, you have to publish this many things, go to this many conferences. These are on top of your normal working hours in your own time. Um, that normally is unpaid for. Um, but like, so these are things to definitely look at. Brilliant. Uh, a side note, I think I remember saying to one of my, fr I, I hated, m I hate my first year me now, but like one of my friends was, um, was like, oh, I asked them in first year, like, what do you want to do like as a specialty? And then they go GP. And I was so like, oh, just a GP. And now I look back on myself and I really hate my comment for that because you really don't, you really underestimate how much people work in the NHS and like whatever the work they do. And so don't ever um, kind of uh, beat someone down for whatever work you assume they do or don't do. That's just a little caveat learning from myself back in the day. Hey, okay, guys. So I've got last few questions that have come in. Um, and, and and as I address them, we'll then um, head off at seven. So, El, um, so Olive Keach. Hey, Olive, do you want to say hello? Uh, you're very welcome, another aspiring medic. Love those type of questions. These are things that I always look at, and that's why I really enjoy your questions. So keep them coming. So Olive um, Keach has gone. Do you know much about applying for deferred entry? Do all med schools allow it, and will it lower my chances of getting in? Um, so to my knowledge, um, I'm not too sure about deferred entry. I just know that when you apply, you apply for that year. And I know UCL allow you a deferred entry as long as you have a reason that they agree with. So I know someone who uh, spent playing, spent their time playing like semi-pro cricket in like Australia for that year. So that's why he deferred and took that gap year. I know other people that had family social circumstances where they were like, I want to defer because I've had problems with finance or this or that. Um, and if their bursary system isn't enough finance wise, they do help them out with it. Um, the other thing um, for deferred entry, this was this is all UCL. And I know UCL is notoriously known as one of the main universities that actually don't mind and encourage um, and give deferred entry offers. So I also know a friend that got an offer for UCL um, and she just applied normally and then she got a deferred entry offer. And at first she was like, hmm, this is a bit weird. But then she took the gap year and took the deferred entry year and she loved it. So um, so that deferred entry is a little bit um, different. So UCL do actually offer that um, without actually taking anything into circumstance. It's their way of saying when you should come in. Um, I don't know how things are working now, especially because I think med school in the next application process and maybe the one after is um, oversubscribed. Uh, just because of the amount of offers they have given and all of this stuff that's been going on with the education system. So they might be changing how they do give deferred entry offers. A lot of med schools in the past year have given deferred entry offers. Uh, what I'd say is look at why you want to do the deferred entry, if it's a personal reason, then talk to the admissions departments of these med schools that you're applying to, call them up, see what they what they say about deferred entry and then take it from there. What I'd say is go... Um, if you can take a gap year before you apply or if you do apply you can then get an offer and then after you get the offer you can talk to them and if it's a really like important personal reason I'm um, that it's up to them but I'm sure they'll try and kind of get a way around it yes on uh, another aspiring medic thank you for your reply there definitely we'd encourage you to get in contact with these departments another aspiring medic thank you so much for making my life easier by typing out everything that needs to be done as well. Olive, good luck with it all. Hope you all, wish you all the best. Another aspiring way it goes. Thank you so much for the comprehensive insight. Before doing the observed GP work, I felt the same way actually, which is really sad. Yeah, I know. I feel really sad about it. I'm an aspiring GP and I want to change the way people think about GPs hopefully in the future. So we'll see about that. But now I think GP might actually be something I'm super interested in. That's really great. Um, a friend of mine has, um, has, um, has told me to read a book about generalists and how generalists are really important as well as people who are specialists in this world. I think the narrative that we are sold, especially in medicine, is that specialization is key, it's the most important, especially in the economies that we're in and everything. However, there's always two sides to the coin and maybe that's something we should talk about in future um, episodes, maybe next week, about generalisms, uh, generalists and how important they are as well, especially in medicine, which is good. I, I forgot the name of the book. I'll next I'll I'll link it next time. So we have a good we'll have a good conversation about it. All right. Okay, last question from another aspiring medic and then we're off. 
what was it like when you had your first clinical exposure to patients? Whew, that is mad. Okay, I was so shook. Like, it is crazy. Like, I'm such a people person. Um, and I, I just, yeah, I'm just such a people person. I'm so calm with people. I'm very relaxed. But I realized that as soon as you add medicine on top of the people person stuff, really early on, it's it, it, like you, your brain isn't used to it. So you're kind of crashing. So I've got science in my head and all the things that I need to do and ask in a, to a patient when I take a history. And then on the other side of things, I've got all the normal things that I do uh, when I communicate with a patient in layman terms. Now I have to combine those two. Um, and so that's why I was like, oh my God, can I remember what? So this was the problem. Like, can I remember what I need to ask in the history? Oh, they said they've got chest pain or abdominal pain here. Or oh, what's the next question? So it's like, I'm going through a thought process in my head because obviously my, my brain isn't used to asking these type of questions in a clinical setting to a patient. So you're nervous and you're trying to think of things. Um, however, having good clinical skills, uh, clinical communication skills kind of helps you out there because it helps soothe things out and mask over the discrepancies that I didn't really know about at the beginning. So yes, my first proper clinical exposure was in fourth year. I think I was like 21. Um, I was asked to go take a history from a patient who had abdominal pain on the on the gastro or kidney ward. I went up to them, started asking them questions and we had a good old chat basically for about an hour. And the history was supposed to take me 10 minutes. So that tells you a lot about how things were, especially at the beginning. Didn't know what to ask. We're just having a conversation by the end of it about her kids, about her family. And I was like, oh God, this is going to be an interesting year. However, what's great is that obviously you already have good communication skills to get into med school. Yeah. And you'll be practicing them all the time. And then you'll be combining that with the science that you learn to then transfer into good communication skills. So let's say if a patient has problems in the uh, in the abdomen let's say they have a problem with their kidneys um to say that someone has problems with their kidneys doesn't really mean anything to someone who doesn't know what a kidney does who doesn't study science which is the general population so then it's more about kind of breaking breaking it down to well, this is what the kidneys do this is what's wrong this is what it will mean what are the good things that's going on what are the bad things how can we help like these are all things that you learn through communication the process that's what is one of the best things that's part of this little job which is great an amazing little question to end on thank you very much oh my god you're like what's the t in socrates again whilst trying to oh my god another spy medic i don't know how you know what socrates is yet because i only found that out when i was 21 so role play but also yes i remember talking to the patient it literally was like i was sad character right basically i was literally just whispering it to myself and closing my eyes the patient was like don't worry i don't worry love i know it's your first time you're not doing anything bad just carry on so jokes it was absolutely jokes okay um anyway that was my first clinical expo exposure thank you all so much amy roshan and Inas, and Olivia and Ma Malika really appreciate it for getting involved and everything uh, yeah that's cool hopefully I've been able to answer some of your questions um, a few important things things like uh, thinking about diversity and uh, race in the medical curricula and and the differences in patient populations as well as discrimination in the NHS um, we talked about UCAT advice we talked about work experiences in for med school, what you need, what you don't need, what's good enough. Um, we started to, we talked about um, transitioning into med school, what to expect, a few things like that. Talked about deferred entry stuff and personal statement advice in general. So another good day at the office for us here at the Med Mentor Weekly Live Clinic. Um, honestly, thank you guys so much for joining. Another aspiring medic, congratulations again. Well done, well done on getting your offer from Liverpool Med School as well. You're going to be a doctor and you're going to make an amazing one, which is great to see. And we'll be celebrating that with the Med Mentor team. Um, we'll be back next week again at six o'clock to seven o'clock um, on the on Instagram Live, on Twitter Live, on YouTube Live, on our website. And I'd encourage you to look out on our Instagram page, our Twitter and the website for all the content we have out there. Our Med Mentor team are full of medical students 
working really hard to deliver you all the best content to help you get into med school, to help you transition into med school and become amazing doctors in the future. And we want to we want that to be all free and for you guys to do that. Um, one thing I tell you guys is to kind of um, look out for a live webinar that um, we're going to be a part of as med mentor with another with another organization uh, again completely free and i'll let you guys know about that in the next few weeks um and uh, yeah anyway um i'm waffling i'll finish off there uh, you're very welcome i've missed uh, these sessions as well with all these guys um and thank you so much amy for joining thank you very much amy um and another aspiring medic as well hey guys thank you all take care of yourselves enjoy your week and i'll see you all very, very soon all right take care Bye-bye. See you guys all on YouTube and stuff. Take care. We've got a little bit. Thank you all for joining. See you later.